Praise the Lord, everyone. I give honour to the Holy Spirit of God, to our overseer Landell, Evangelist Landell, Minister Rob, Saints and Friends. I greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining me for Sunday School today. We'll begin by breathing a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once more we come in the precious name of Jesus. Father, we honour you, we adore you, we magnify your name. We give you thanks, Lord, that you've kept us throughout the course of the week. Father, you've kept us in health and you've kept us in our right minds. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the opportunity to come together in Sunday school once more. Father, prepare our hearts for all that you have for us today. And Father, as we come to study your word, we pray that the word will begin to take root and that it will bring forth fruit in our hearts, that we are not only hearers of the word, but we will be doers also. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today, we're focusing on lesson eight. Our topic is, God is always faithful. And those of us who have been with him over a period of time, we know that that is true. Praise the Lord. Our lesson text is taken from Malachi 1, verses 6 to 14. Our focus thought is continual reminders of God's faithfulness keep spiritual discouragement at bay. Our focus verse is taken from Malachi 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The Lord doesn't change. Praise the Lord. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. The book of Malachi was written by the prophet Malachi himself in 430 to 420 BC. The name Malachi means messenger. He was a devout Jew in post-exilic Judah, a contemporary of Nehemiah. When Malachi wrote, the post-exilic Jews in Palestine were again experiencing spiritual decline. The people had become cynical, doubting God's love and promises, questioning his justice, and disbelieving there was any profit in obeying his commandments. As their faith dimmed, they became mechanical and insensitive in their observances of worship, indifference to the requirements of the law and guilty of all kinds of trespasses against the covenant. Malachi's purpose for writing was threefold to get the people to repent before God, to remove the obstacles that were blocking God's favour, and to get the people to return to God and his covenant with sincere hearts. Praise the Lord. Let's focus on the topic for the moment. God is always faithful. To be faithful is to be reliable, steadfast and unwavering. Faithfulness is an attribute of God. It is part of his divine nature. We can put our trust in him because he will never let us down. From the scripture, we learn that when God says he will do something, he does it, even when it seems impossible. When he says something will happen, it happens. 
Numbers 23, 19 tells us, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfil it? The author of Lamentations states that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Praise the Lord. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The aims of our lesson today. Firstly, to examine the state of the post-exilic Jews and the reasons for God's displeasure. Secondly, to examine Malachi's rebuke. And thirdly, to understand that God is always faithful. We can put our trust in him and we will never be put to shame. Praise the Lord. The prophet Malachi is the last known prophet in the post-exilic period. Let's just revise what we know about the post-exilic period and the rebuilding of the temple from our previous lessons. The first six chapters of Ezra relate the story of the rebuilding of the temple under the leadership of Governor Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua. It can be easily forgotten that by the time of Ezra, this was already decades old history. We know from scripture that Ezra served under the Persian ruler Artaxerxes I and Ezra led a group of returnees to Jerusalem in 4 58 BC and you'll find that in Ezra 7 verse 8. Nehemiah followed in 40, 445 BC. Nehemiah 1 verse 1. That was almost 60 years after the temple had been rebuilt and over 80 years after Cyrus had allowed the Jews to return to the promised land. We know from Ezra's account that the period of temple rebuilding had been a time of significant revival, led by the ministries of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, culminating with all the men of Israel observing the Passover celebration for the first time since the days of King Josiah. However, it's clear from the rest of the account of Ezra and Nehemiah that this spiritual fervour did not last. Praise the Lord. The burden of the word of the Lord was given to Israel by Malachi. Malachi 1 verse 1. Let's just summarise what was said in verses 1 to 5 before going into our lesson text. The people were doubting that God really loved them. Having experienced trouble, they accused God of being unfaithful to his covenant promises. The Lord insisted that he'd taken care of them over the years. It was Israel who had failed to honour to honor God by their disobedience to his laws. God told them that he had chosen Jacob, their forefather, not Esau, his brother, to inherit the covenant promises and to be the forefather from whom the Messiah would come. Malachi used a form of dialogue known as disputation. The prophetic word is structured as an imaginary 
dialogue or conversation between God and his people. The pattern can be seen clearly in the opening oracle in Malachi 1 verses 1 to 5. The basic pattern of the disputation is 1. A claim about God's divine nature. For example, God says, I have loved you. 2. The people then question the divine claim. How have you loved us? And three, evidence of God's claim is given. For example, God says, Esau have I hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage. When God laid out the evidence to support his initial claim through the prophet Malachi, the people's question was made to look very foolish. In the opening oracle, the very fact that the people of God dwelt in their homeland once again, while the nation of Edom had been extinguished from world history, was proof enough that God truly did love them and had kept his word to them. Praise the Lord. Malachi brought an accusation against the priests in the land. In Malachi 1, 6-7, they were accused of despising God's name, not giving it the reverence and respect that it deserved. To this, of course, they pleaded not guilty and they challenged God to prove it to them. This shows their lack of reverence and respect to the Lord. Their defence was in fact their offence and in justifying themselves, their own tongues condemned them and their saying, Wherein have we despised thy name? Malachi 1, 6 And wherein have we polluted thee? Malachi 1, 7 The people's lack of reverence to God was shown by their actions. They viewed the table and the altar of the Lord as contemptible and they thought that anything could serve as a sacrifice. This was contrary to the law of God. Leviticus 22, 22 states, blind or broken or maimed or having a wen or scurvy or scabbed, ye shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. They should have bought the best that they had, but instead they picked out the worst, which was neither fit for the market nor fit for their own tables, and offered that at God's altar. With every sacrifice they were to bring a meat offering of fine flour mingled with oil, but they bought polluted bread. Malachi 1 7, that is coarse bread, servant's bread. Though the law stated that animals offered in sacrifices should not have a blemish, yet they bought the blind, the lame and the sick. Malachi 1 8 and again Malachi 1 13. The torn and the lame and the sick that was ready to die of itself. They looked no further than the burning of the sacrifice and they pleaded that it was a pity to burn it if it was good for anything else. The people were convinced that it was their duty 
to bring a sacrifice, but their sacrifices were offered in vain. The people mocked God and deceived themselves by bringing the worst that they had. The priests, who should have known better, accepted the gifts brought to the altar and offered them up. If they should refuse them, the people would have bought none at all. God asked them the question in Malachi 1.8 And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Such animals would be considered an insult if they had been offered to a human governor. Some of us are so professional in carrying out our duties at work. The question is, do we use the same degree of professionalism when we're doing things for the Lord? As believers in Christ, we must give God the best that we have. If we worship God with our understanding, we're bringing a blind sacrifice. If we are cold and dull and dead in our worship, we are bringing a sick sacrifice. If we worship in the flesh and do not put our heart into it, we are bringing a lame sacrifice. And if we suffer vain thoughts and distractions, we are bringing a torn sacrifice. Our whole life should be a living sacrifice to God. Romans 12 verse 1. It is our reasonable service. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The people's spiritual condition had steadily deteriorated. Here, we do not find some big radical act of rebellion against God, like in the book of Exodus and the story of the golden calf. There, the sinful people cried to Aaron, make us gods, Exodus 32 verse 1. In their one statement, they had violated the first three commandments. In Malachi's day, no high places to false gods had been constructed. Jehovah's temple was not desecrated. Instead, the passion that had inflamed the hearts of the people in Zerubbabel and Joshua's days had slowly faded to a flicker. The people of Israel backslid while still going through the motions and offering unacceptable sacrifices. To backslide is to lapse or fall back into sin. The Bible tells us in James 4, 17, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Brethren and friends, let us examine ourselves to make sure that we are still going forward in the Lord and not dropping back. Praise the Lord. The book of Malachi presents a sober warning about the effects of discouragement. The, people, the people's disappointment with the outcome of their efforts slowly turned to accusations against God. Things were going wrong for them because of their disobedience to God, but they didn't see it that way. In essence, they said, 
God doesn't love us and God doesn't listen to our prayers. See, Malachi 1, 2. Malachi 2, 13 to 14. They began to make excuses for their own unrighteousness. Entirely missing the way that they had dishonoured God's name. Malachi 1, 6-7 And even robbed him of what rightfully belonged to him. Malachi 3, 7-8 Perhaps the most frightening realisation in Malachi is that the people of Israel were backslidden and didn't even know it. They were being deliberately disobedient to God's commands, especially about sacrifice and tithing. Let's look at what they should have done. So we're just going to look at Leviticus 1.10 and then Leviticus 27, 30 to 32. Leviticus 1.10 says, And if his offering be of the flocks, namely of the sheep, or the goats for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. So this is the quality that they should have bought. Leviticus 27, 30 to 32, and all the tithe, the tenth part of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem any part of his tithe, he shall add one-fifth to it. For every tithe of the herd or flock, whatever passes under the shepherd's staff, the tenth one shall be holy unto the Lord. And that scripture from Leviticus 27 was in the Amplified Version to give more clarity. The people felt justified in their sin and it began with discouragement. It's important to identify the root cause of our behaviour, to confront it, repent and then get in line with God's word. We can't afford to listen to the voice of the enemy. The enemy will tell you that God doesn't love you or even that the brethren don't love you. Before long, you begin to drop off the things of God and fall back into hold habits, believing that no one cares. The devil is a liar. Focus on what the Bible says. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're talking about agape love, God's unconditional love. Praise the Lord. Jesus told his disciples in John 13, 34 to 35, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Praise the Lord. In the climate that we're living in, it is easy to be discouraged. When we feel discouraged, we can find strength and deliverance from the Word of God. Proverbs 4, 20 to 22 encourages us. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. 
keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. In other words, God's word is medicine. It's health and healing to our bodies. Praise the Lord. Stand on the word of God. Declare it out loud as often as you can until it takes root and changes you from the inside out. Praise the Lord. God has a word for the discouraged. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Romans 15 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Deuteronomy 31 8 And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. John 16 33 Jesus said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and he overcome the world on our behalf. Praise the Lord. 1 Peter 5 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Our God never changes. Praise the Lord. He is faithful. Malachi did not attempt to encourage the people by focusing on the handful of things that they were doing right or by trying to justify their motives. He blatantly exposed their unrighteousness in Malachi 3, 8 to 9, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But, ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Malachi did not allow his concern for their feelings to override his prophetic task to rebuke the unrighteousness and to call them to renew their covenant with God and be faithful. However, God's word for the people did not stop with the pronouncement of a curse for their robbery. Malachi continued, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now wherein, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts Malachi 3 10 to 12 even though the people had lost their initial zeal for God and their observances of God's covenant had grown lax, they were still God's chosen people and all the promises 
of their covenant relationship with God could still be theirs if they would obey God with a sincere heart. Praise the Lord. God is ever faithful. He is faithful to his promises. Praise the Lord. Malachi illustrates God's faithfulness. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. His faithfulness guarantees both punishment for the wicked and salvation for those who repent of their wickedness. Centuries before the prophet Malachi, Moses stood before the people of Israel with the self-same message. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, and thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 to 20. As in the days of Moses and Malachi, these two same options stand before us today. God's righteous purpose will be established in this world. Will we serve him or choose to serve ourselves? Brethren, friends, choose life. It is important to acknowledge and confront our own shortcomings and backslidings, those areas where we've lost our focus and our passion for what we know is right. We can do that with honesty because of the unwavering faithfulness of God and his promise to protect and provide for us. Through repentance, we can find renewed strength, renewed vision and renewed focus. Just the encouragement that we need to live an overcoming life of victory. Brethren and friends, we serve an awesome God. He is forever faithful. The promises of God are yes and amen. Let us draw near to God and he in turn will draw near to us. Thank you for joining me for Sunday School today. I hope that it has been of use to you. God bless you. Amen. <music>